Hey folks, this is the Yaku Cosmopolitan. Happy New Year and welcome to my MPB recap for December 2022. This is a new series that I started last month where I go over uh, all the news from Japanese baseball from the previous month. And once the season begins, hopefully I can make this a weekly thing where I talk about games. But obviously in December there are no games, so the only thing that we really have to talk about is free agency. But there was a lot of movement in that domain. So uh, let's get started here by talking about outfielder Masataka Yoshida going from the Oryx Buffaloes to the Boston Red Sox on a five-year $90 million deal during the winter meetings. Now, a lot of people have been confused with what Boston's doing with their offseason. Obviously, they let uh, face of the fran franchise Xander Bogars walk. He went to San Diego, and then they also had other uh, significant players like Nathan Eovaldi leaving but then they brought in Yoshida on this really big deal which if you include the posting fee uh, the Red Sox are going to be paying over a hundred million dollars so they're really high on Yoshida obviously uh, and then they also brought in guys like Justin Turner and Kenley Jansen so people are definitely wondering what's going on here with Heim Bloom's kind of master plan but I like this signing for both Yoshida and for Boston because I think uh, much like Seiya Suzuki last year, who got $5 million uh, less from the Chicago Cubs, I think by going to Boston, Yoshida will be able to have at least one year to kind of settle in where the expectations are not going to be quite as uh, unrealistic and the spotlight's not always going to be on him because, you know, the Red Sox have a pretty good team, but I don't think most pundits expect them to be on the level of, of the Yankees, of the Blue Jays, of the Rays, or maybe even of the up-and-coming Orioles. I mean, they just finished in last place, uh, and then they're losing Bogarts, and they might lose Devers after this season. So Boston, kind of in a transition period, uh, gives Yoshida a little bit of time to maybe settle in. According to fan graphs, he's, cur he's currently penciled in uh, into left field as the leadoff guy. So Su uh, Seiya Suzuki very similar but different you know in many ways to to Yoshida in terms of weighted runs created plus they're right next to each other uh in ter in terms of the all-time MPB leaderboards uh, I believe uh, Yoshida is maybe maybe number six and then Seiya Suzuki's number seven for players with at least 3,000 career plate appearances so they're both uh, you know in terms of the rate rate stats they are among the 10 greatest hitters in MPB history and Suzuki had a great uh, a start to his season, but then he dealt with some injuries and he kind of cooled off after that. But he showed a lot of promise, and I think by going to Chicago, he didn't have all that pressure on him that he would have had if he went to a, a, an even bigger market team with, with bigger expectations. So obviously Boston's a big market team, but because the expectations are a little bit lower, I think uh, Yoshida's going to be able to uh, settle in and then maybe starting from year two and three that's when he can really uh, start to shine then we had right-handed pitcher Kodai Senga signing with the New York Mets on a five-year 75 million dollar deal and I think that's honestly a steal to get a guy like Senga um, a lot of people have pointed out the New York Mets offseason they lost Jacob deGrom but they used that money to sign Justin Verlander Jose Quintana and and Kodai Senga so that seems like a pretty good haul from me and what I really love about this signing is that for Senga much like what I just said with Yoshida I don't think the pressure is going to be too high if Senga was going to a team like I don't know maybe the Angels or the Cardinals uh, I think the pressure is going to be really on him to be that true ace that he's expected to be. But now that he's joining a Mets rotation that consists of Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer, two of, you know, among the greatest pitchers of this generation at the front, Senga can slide in as a number three and kind of quietly put together what I think is going to be an incredible uh, MLB career for him. He is a little bit older than a lot of Japanese pitchers who go over because the Hawks have a no posting policy and he had to wait until he got his international free agent rights but in terms of the pure stuff Senga is legit uh, a lot of people including myself like to compare him to Kevin Gosman because he has that wipeout uh, fork ball slash splitter uh, and he averages around 96 miles per hour on the fastball so I think Senga and, and the Mets are a really good fit 
Okay, and now moving on to the MPB side of things, you have Kensuke Kondo, superstar formerly of the Nippon Ham Fighters, moving to the SoftBank Hawks as he signed a mega contract worth around 36 million US dollars over seven years, which, you know, if you're thinking MLB standards, that's not a lot, but, but in MPB, that is a huge deal, one of the biggest contracts ever given out. And I made a video about just Kondo and Mori uh, last month, but essentially what the Hawks are doing here is they're preventing all of their Pacific Pacific League rivals from getting their hands on one of the best pure hitters in the league. In fact, now that Yoshida's gone, I think you can say that Kondo is the best pure hitter in Japan right now. Uh, the, the Hawks outfield is already pretty crowded, so I'm not really sure how they're going to deploy Kondo, but the fact of the matter is, it doesn't really matter. He can shine wherever you put him, you can have him you know, DH, you can stick him in left field, put him at the top of the lineup as a table setter, has an elite eye, great contact rates, or you can put him in the middle of the lineup and he can be kind of a gap-to-gap -gap doubles guy to drive in a lot of runs. However they use him, I think Kondo is going to be uh, a really great piece to hopefully, for, uh, from the Hawks' perspective, get them back into championship contention, especially after they lost a superstar like Kodai Senga. They needed to kind of gain another superstar even though he's not a pitcher in order to kind of make up for that loss right so uh, i think kondo is going to be very successful in a soft pink hawks uniform but it's going to be awfully uh weird to see after seeing him um you know rep rep the fighters for uh, for a decade okay and then you have a couple of bigger name um uh, foreigners coming into japan so the first one is frank schwindel frank schwindel obviously for the second half of the 2021 season was outstanding with the Chicago Cubs. He had an OPS over a thousand and everyone was calling him one of the one of the late bloomers, one of the biggest breakout stars uh, of the year. But, you know, as some expected, he hit, hit the regression curve, hit pretty hard and he did not have a very good 2022 season. So now he's joining the Oryx Buffaloes. And I love this move for the Oryx Buffaloes because Schwindel, is a proven MLB hitter. I know he doesn't have, he hasn't shown the consistency, but just over a year ago, he proved that he can hit at the highest level um, and be among the best hitters in the league. He had a 166 OPS plus through 56 games in 2021 and over his entire career in MLB uh, through 145 games, he has a 111 WR uh, OPS plus. And these are typically the type of guys that do well in Japan, guys who have had success, even if it's limited success at the MLB level, those guys are more likely to succeed than, say, like, uh, 4A guys who have crushed AAA but have struggled at the MLB level. Some, some of those guys do succeed, but it's typically more like more guys like Schwindel. I mean, look at Tyler Austin, who, you know, injuries aside, has been one of the best um, uh imports of the last couple of years and he also had an OPS in the 700s in MLB so I, I really like this move for Oryx in order to make up for the loss of Yoshida they had to do you know every little thing that they can do um, to regain some power and they brought in Tomoya Mori from the Seibu Lions he'll be their catcher and now they have Frank Schwindel who if he's able to adapt to Japanese pitching he can maybe be like an like a 850 to 900 OPS guy, I feel like, with 20 to 25 bombs in him. So that would be a huge addition for Oryx. And then they also have a couple more additions. Uh, outfielder Leandro Cedeno. Now he's more of these one of these 4A guys that, that I just mentioned, uh, coming over from the Arizona Diamondbacks organization. Uh, don't believe he has any MLB experience, but he played for AAA Reno last year where he had a 764 OPS, which is actually below average in the PCL. But then in AA, uh, which is where he spent the majority of time, he had a 937 OPS. So Cedeno, definitely a much more risky pickup. Very, very much a, a boomer bust type guy. And I think he's definitely more likely to be a bust, but does have pretty good raw power. So uh, an interesting addition for Oryx indeed. And this one hasn't been uh, official or finalized yet, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on here, but uh, outfielder Brent Rooker has also been rumored to go to Oryx, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, maybe now that they got Cedeno, 
Um, that part is canceled out. Maybe those were just rumors that I was reading, but I did hear quite a bit that Brent Rooker was on his way to Oryx. Uh, and then they also added uh, utility man Marwin Gonzalez. He spent 2022 with the New York Yankees, did not put up very good numbers, and in fact, he hasn't really been a great hitter ever since 2017 with the Houston Astros, as he obviously became kind of the poster child of the Houston Astros uh, sign-stealing scandal. He had a great season in 2017, but a lot of people write that off now because uh, of the scandal. Um, but, you know, I don't think Oryx is really bringing him in for the bad. I just think they are trying to kind of fill out um, uh, defensively. And having a guy like Gonzalez who can basically play any position you want him to is is going to be uh, invaluable. Uh, I know he's old, so th his defensive metrics are definitely not worth what they used to be. But at one time, he was uh, a, an elite defender at multiple positions. So I think for Oryx... You know, I'm not sure how much playing time Gonzalez is going to end up getting, but, you know, if Oryx has an injury at, at a certain position, then Gonzalez can, can slot in there. So for a championship caliber team, having a guy like Gonzalez seems uh, like, like a solid addition to me, at least. Okay, and then for the Cebu Lions signings, they brought in David McKinnon, first baseman, third baseman, left fielder, so I just uh, marked him as a utility man. Uh, not much success with the Angels, but he did have an OPS over a thousand in AAA. Although again, that's that's the PCL we're talking about, where offenses are off the charts. So I wouldn't read too much into that. But uh, McKinnon is basically going to be the replacement for uh, Jansen Witt, and Witt was not very good last year. So I think uh, it, it's going to be pretty easy for McKinnon to at least be a little bit better than that. And for those of you unaware, McKinnon is is the guy who kind of went viral last year uh, when uh, sitting next to Noah Syndergaard because he had that same hair. So he's regarded as like Thor 2.0. Um, just a fun fact there. And then the other guy Cebu brought in was outfielder Mark Payton, who has had a little bit of MLB experience with uh, the New York Mets and the Chicago White Sox. Spent most of the year in AAA though where he had a 908 OPS with 25 bombs, which is in the International League, um, not quite as as uh, offensively explosive, you could say, as the PCL, but still a hitter's league. So again, not sure how much you read into that, but Mark Payton is essentially the replacement for uh, Brian O'Grady, who the Lions let go, and O'Grady is now going to uh, the KBO. Now, I must say... It seems to me, at least, that the Lions are downgrading every year. They had Corey Spangenberg, who had a 120 WRC plus uh, in his two seasons with the Lions. They, but you know, I understand he had a terrible strikeout rate and his defense wasn't all that great. So they wanted to try someone else, and then they brought in O'Grady, who, yes, he had a second half collapse where he basically gave them no production at all. But in the first half. Uh, he had 14 home runs, and he was a well above average hitter every single month. And even with that second half uh, collapse included, he was the best foreign import last season in the Pacific League. He is not a guy that I would have let go if I'm the Cebu Lions. And now they bring in Mark Payton, who, you know, with all due respect to him, I think he's a downgrade from both O'Grady and Spangenberg. So... Um, you know, I could be proven wrong here if he becomes a really good productive everyday player, but I don't really like how the Lions are just clicking reset every single season and bringing in, you know, pretty similar types of players out left handed, uh, you know, outfielders who are, who are kind of 4A type guys who have a little bit of MLB experience, but, you know, haven't really been able to put up the offensive numbers there. So if I'm the Lions, I'm, I would be much more focused on just keeping uh, these guys for two to three seasons and see if they get any better. I definitely think they're making a mistake by letting go of O'Grady, but I guess we'll see what uh, Peyton can do. Okay, moving on, uh, the Omiuri Giants. Uh, we talked last month about how they brought in Tyler Beatty, and now they're also bringing in uh, right-hander Yoan Lopez, who has pitched for the New York Mets and Arizona Diamondbacks. Really good pure stuff. And now that the Giants are losing um, the likes of Thiago Vieira and uh, Ruby De La Rosa, Lopez 
uh, expects to factor in to one of these high leverage late inning kind of roles. He throws very hard, so you know those types of guys are always a little bit iffy coming to MPB because obviously they probably have uh, immense command issues. And Lopez has had uh, over uh, four walks per nine innings at the MLB level in each of his last uh, three stints. So maybe Lopez ends up being a complete dud, but maybe he also uh, has some success and he's able to be uh, a great late innings option for, for the Giants uh, to go alongside Taisei in the ninth inning. Uh, but then the Giants lost two players, uh, CC Mercedes, left-handed pitcher, and outfielder Gregory Polanco, um, who were both on the Giants last year. Both of them are going to the Chibolote Marines. So the Marines have been able to poach these two players who the Giants did not want to keep for whatever reason. Um, you know, both of them, I can I can see why the Giants wanted to let him go, but at the same time, much like with the O'Grady situation, uh, I just I just don't agree. So beginning with Polanco, here's a guy who hit 24 home runs in his debut season in MPB, playing almost every day. Now, did he have a great average? No. Did he have a great on-base percentage? No. Did he play good defense? No. But... At the same time, uh, and this was really the point of the of the MPB foreigners, the the state of MPB foreigners video that I made uh, this week. But you have to kind of, you know, accept what you're gonna get. And if you're you've, if you found a guy who can give you 20 plus homers, and Polanco, I think, is capable of even more than that. Uh, I think you know if he settles in a little bit, I think he could be a 30 plus home run guy. You know why why let him go? You know, and especially when you have the money. Um, and now for the Marines, I, I love this signing because the the Marines are hurting were hurting offensively last year. They're losing Brandon Laird and Leonis Martin, two longtime foreigners, and so they needed kind of a new uh, proven foreign bat to bring in. And I know Polanco's only been you know in Japan for a year, but again, 24 home runs in your debut season is not bad at all. And the defense isn't even going to matter at this point because they can just slot him into DH. So. Uh, Polanco, I love that pickup for the Marines, but I love this pickup of CC Mercedes even more. CC Mercedes has been one of the most consistent pitchers in Japan for the better part of the last half decade or so. Going back to 2018 with the Giants, he has a 3.14 ERA, and every single season he's pitched, he has an ERA pretty much in the in the low to mid threes except for the debut season where he had an ERA of 2.05 which you know was really his kind of breakout campaign um, and I understand he hasn't thrown more than 120 innings in a season before so he's not really the, the kind of guy you can rely on to be you know an innings eater or an ace but the innings he gives you are very quality and he gives you a chance to win every time out so again for the Giants I'm just not sure I don't understand why they let CC Mercedes go. Giants were not a team that had, um, you know, an abundance of pitching last year. In fact, they were lacking a lot of pitching depth. And I know they have a lot of uh, young arms that they're really high on. But at the same time, Mercedes was a guy who was kind of a glue pitcher. He was going to give you stability in the rotation. And if worst comes to worst, you can just throw him in, in the bullpen. And I think he would do just fine. So... I love these two pickups for for the Marines, you know, going across uh, and, and taking these two guys from from Yomiuri. Um, another guy who's a very interesting pickup for me is right-handed pitcher Kaoni Kayla, going to the Yakult Swallows. So the Swallows let uh, Scott McGough, their longtime closer, go. Um, you know, largely due to his poor performance in the 2022 Japan series, where his defensive errors themselves probably cost them two games um and he wasn't particularly good in the 2021 japan series either but in the regular season mcgoff had been one of the best closers in the league for the past uh, two seasons so kaoni kayla has pretty big shoes to fill yakult also brought in uh, dylan peters and rinal espinal two pitchers so those guys may also uh, factor into uh the the bullpen as well but i think kayla is the guy who you know, on paper, uh, is going to have the highest highest expectations, obviously, because Kayla had been a really solid uh, pitcher for a couple of seasons there with with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, 
from 2018 to 2020, um, he had an ERA below three, and he had 11 strikeouts per nine innings across 89 games. Uh, and then he went to the San Diego Padres in 2021, had to get Tommy John surgery, didn't pitch. Uh, at, he signed with the Los Angeles Dodgers organization, but he didn't pitch at the major league level in 2022. Um, so obviously, really high upside here. He's only 30 years old. Um, any guy who gets Tommy John, you don't really know, you know, how he's going to come back from it. But, you know, it's not like the old days where Tommy John was basically the end of your career. A lot of guys come back even stronger from Tommy John these days. And Kayla has averaged across his MLB career 96.7 miles per hour on the fastball. So the velo, the stuff is definitely going to play at the MPB level. It's just going to be a matter of of how well he can adapt. But I love this signing for for the Occult Swallows. You know, there aren't many guys they could have realistically gotten, in my opinion, who would be a better option uh, as a potential closer than than Kayla. And you know, maybe you don't want him to close. Maybe you use him as a seventh or eighth inning guy, and then you slot uh, setup man Noboru Shimizu uh, as as your closer. Either way, I think Kayla is going to succeed with the Swallows next season. Uh, and then let's finish off here by talking about uh, three more additions that the SoftBank Hawks made. They really have been completely uh, reconstructing their entire foreign core this offseason. Uh, outfielder Courtney Hawkins got an invite to, to fall camp back in November. That was basically a tryout for the team, and it appears he made the cut because he officially signed with them. Uh, he played in indie ball last year with uh, Lexington in the uh, Atlantic League where he had a 1055 OPS with 48 homers in 127 games. So this guy can mash. He's a former top prospect, uh, has a ton of raw power, but obviously wasn't really able to put it together for an MLB career. But if you just take, if you just watch this guy take BP, he hits absolute moonshots. Um, and for a Hawks team that is already pretty, you know, uh, set in place, uh, I think Hawkins, this, despite the, it's, it's a risk they can take. Um, and Adam Walker really, I think, opened the door for this type of uh, uh, of transaction. Last offseason, when he came over from Indie Ball, he played in with with Milwaukee. Going to the Omiuri Giants, he was one of the most successful foreigners in all of MPB last year. So I think that opened the door for a guy like Hawkins to make the move from independent league uh, in the U.S. to Nippon Professional Baseball, which admittedly is a really big jump. And then they poached two guys from from uh, two uh, MPB teams. So Roberto Osuna came mid-season last year to the to the Lotte Marines, and you know, off field off the field issues aside, he was elite. Had an ERA below one. His command is absolutely impeccable. He is basically the definition of what you want out of a closer. He's the epitome of a perfect closer with the low walk rate, doesn't give up um, many home runs. And, you know, even if he doesn't have a crazy strikeout rate, he still gets a lot of them. So um, I guess he can factor in with Levon Moinello between the eighth and the ninth inning. Either of those guys are, are going to be absolutely elite. Um, you know, just another reason why I think the Hawks are going to uh, take back the pennant next year. And then they also got Joe Gunkel, who spent a couple of years with the Hanshin Tigers. Gunkel was was very productive with the Tigers. From 2020 to 2022, he had a 2.92 ERA through 262 innings. Not much of a strikeout guy, but but great ground ball pitcher. Um, but, you know, if any team can afford to let a guy like that go, it would be the Hanshin Tigers. They have so much elite pitching, so... Tigers didn't need him, but the Hawks, you know, losing Kodai Senga, uh, they definitely need all the pitching depth they can get, and I figure that Gunkul will uh, slot right into the back end of their rotation, and then somebody else like uh, Shuta Ishikawa or Carter Stewart Jr. or Koya Fuji will be expected to to make that jump and become the true ace of the Hawks. But Gunkul doesn't have to be an ace, he just has to be... Uh, a consistent kind of back of the rotation guy and then just three points what to watch for this upcoming month Lewis Brinson to the Omiuri Giants uh, that's been rumored for about an entire month now so I'm not sure what's going on there but 
Uh, I did say last month that the Giants are looking to add a big name uh, guy with, with MLB experience. And, you know, while, while the guys like Adam Duvall or Kevin Kiermeyer that I floated probably aren't going to be uh, coming over, Lewis Brinson would still be a pretty big addition. Obviously not a guy who's had much MLB success, but was a key piece in that Christian Yelich trade that brought um, Yelich over to, to the Brewers where he won uh, an MVP award. Brinson was one of the key prospects in that trade. And in terms of his raw athleticism and talent, I think I think it's all there. It's just about you know somehow putting it together. I do worry for him. Um, not not really great at hitting off-speed pitches coming over to an off-speed heavy league, but at the very least, he'll give you really good defense in center field, and that's what the Giants are looking for. They're looking for a guy to slot into center field now that Yoshihiro Maru is moving to right. Uh, another point, who will the Nippon Ham Fighters select as their compensation pick from SoftBank? So, the way MPB free agency works, if you lose a... a uh, marquee free agent like Kensuke Kondo, then the team that loses that player gets to select from uh, a list of guys that are not protected. And so the and the Hawks have so much depth that the Nippon Ham Fighters will have their hands full in terms of who, who they want to get. If they want to get a hitter, I think, you know, a young prospect with a lot of high upside like Richard Sunagawa might be available, but I feel like they're probably going to go with a pitcher. Um, maybe Ray Takahashi is, is a name I've seen floated, but, but we'll see what, what the fighters do. That pick's going to be coming up pretty soon, uh, as the Hawks need to submit their protection list. And then just final point, WBC Samurai Japan roster news. Uh, we did see last week that Masataka Yoshida declared or committed to play at the tournament, which came as a surprise to me because... A lot of people were expecting both him and Senga to skip the tournament going over to MLB in their first year, having to practice in spring training and, and all that. But no, Yoshida has committed for the WBC. We'll see what Senga does too, but uh, it's just further proof that Kuriyama's Samurai Japan are in it to win it. They're trying to put together the best team they possibly can, and I expect we'll see um, more roster news and maybe even a finalized roster uh, coming up in the next month. So uh, that's about it for now. This video has gone to about half an hour, which is a little longer than I expected. But let me know your thoughts below about any of these uh, particular free agents or anything I, I might have missed. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe for more MPB content in English.